Tony, and I'm the Research Development and Knowledge Manager at Olin. Max Dixon is my colleague, scape designer at Olin. Um, today we were sharing our Pridescapes and Design for Neurodivergence Emergent Research Initiatives at Olin. I believe our work has been really powerful because it is emergent. Both projects started from the ground up due to our own deep interest in personal identity as well as discovering the same passion with others at Olin. So both of our projects are, or have been developed with the support of Olin Labs. What is Olin Labs? It's a community of practice embedded within our studio, which has always promoted a culture of teaching and learning, but Labs is where our collective knowledge comes together, and that's where the knowledge manager <laughs> comes in here. Very nice. <laughs> We've been working to identify opportunities to explore more deeply, and Labs helps to serve as a conduit between academia and practice. And it's divided into five interdependent labs, and they work across design teams and across labs to identify trends in our project work as well as you know, across the field, and specifically helping to identify gaps in research. And these trends and gaps are opportunities for deeper education and development efforts, right, and provide the groundwork for primary research in initiatives that have been led by Olin Labs, which is super exciting too. Um, it really just speaks to our leadership's dedication to moving the field forward. So these are the divisions of the different types of initiatives within Olin Labs. It's divided into education, development, and research, with education being kind of the core and development being the next level where tools and methods are designed and developed to help us do our work. And then all of those kind of support larger research initiatives where we're connecting with the external different fields across transdisciplinary, those types of things. And our work has been part of education, essentially. So the initiatives themselves, they, there's four different types, four different categories, project-based, partner-led, lab, labs fellowship, and then where our projects are located, the emergent initiatives. So these are really educational opportunities that have been brought to the table by designers, such as ourselves, which are promoted and given dedicated hours with which to pursue deeper dives. So within this supportive framework of Olin Labs, we've been able to find and build community at Olin, which has been, I think, the biggest <laughs> help to getting our work done um, and discovering common ground. The lessons I've learned in developing and sharing my own work, which I'm going to discuss next, are what have allowed me to assist Max and hopefully serve as an ally in promoting his work also in order to support and encourage his Pridescapes work too, which he's going to share a little bit later. Inclusion and Access, revisit, Revisiting Universal Design. This is my beloved Dilworth Park, and it is an Olin project, but <laughs> I loved this project in 2014 when it opened, and I did not know it was an Olin project at that time. But this is in, this is in Philadelphia at City Hall. It's, I think, a really great example of universal design and a complete transformation from what it had been previously. Um, the biggest deal is that the entire plaza was lifted to street level and it's totally accessible and fun and vibrant and the doorstep into the city. We are, as landscape architects, tasked with the responsibility to design inclusive and accessible environments for all users. It includes people with physical, intellectual, developmental, and or cognitive disabilities. So within People Lab, this project, Revisiting Universal Design, it developed in collaboration between myself and um, a dear friend and former colleague at Olin, Alexa Vaughn. So in People Lab, Alexa and I built kind of upon our independent work where we've been questioning how designers can create more accessible and inclusive landscapes for specific disabled communities. And what we came to understand and supported each other is kind of trying to reframe the idea of disability through the social model of disability, which it respects the user's needs and gives equal attention to what the person can do, and that the built environment is often what is disabling. So this approach is in opposition to the idea of a medical model of disability that focuses on what is wrong with the person, not what the person needs. So the social model, it doesn't seek to fix or or change the disabled person. We're looking to design for how people are right now. 
And this is, of course, building upon universal design. Um, Alexa, she was doing her work designing for deaf and hard of hearing people, her deafscapes work. And my work focuses on designing for neurodiversity. So this whole conversation came up, designing for different communities. And is there a purpose to that that's distinct from designing for all communities, all different disabled people? And that was the question faced by Ronald Mace when he kicked off universal design at NC State. Great school, wonderful. Center for Universal Design. Um, so that was in the 1990s. And as a reminder, universal design is the design of products or environments that are meant to be usable for all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation. Within this, new, within this initiative at Olin Labs, we're asking designers to continue this work, continue to assess our different design models and our projects, specifically through the social model of dis disability. The primary way that we can do so is by including and centering disabled people as experts of their lived experience. And intentionally identifying and desi designing out these very real barriers to public life. So public life equals social inclusion. So this has been one of the most important outcomes for me is finding and building community. Alexa and I were able to do that and through having an educational series back in 2019. So it was a series of three different events. We had Dr. Victor Pineda provide an introduction to disability for the staff at Olin, because a lot of people aren't familiar with much about disability and people don't know how to talk about it. Um, and that's important to welcome people into that way of thinking. And then I presented my work designed for autism and neurodiversity, looking specifically at the sensory landscape. And then Alexa, her work with DeafScape. And then we wrapped up the week with a DeafScape discussion panel. We invited Alexa's former colleagues, Derek Bem, who's a planner and instructor at Gaidet, and Sean Mywald, who's a public policy expert and adjunct professor at Gaidet as well. So they joined us for a discussion panel, which was interpreted with an ASL interpreter, and it was a really good experience even seeing that happen and learning from how everybody's communicating, even seeing in space how signing does require a certain amount of space in order to communicate. It's a big realization. What is neurodivergence? Um, so it recognizes that everybody's brain develops in a unique way and that there are no right or wrong neurotypes. Judy Singer, uh, an Australian sociologist and autism rights activist, coined the word neurodiversity in 1998 to articulate the needs of people with autism, with autism who didn't want to be defined by a disability label but wished to be seen. It includes lots of different things like ADHD, autism, <laughs> sensory processing disorder, these are the senses. There's more than just the five. There's interoception and vestibular and proprioception. It's feeling your body in space and feeling your internal body. There has been a lot of research where physically or visually demonstrating brains are different, and that's really exciting. So I have a proposed research project. I love David Byrne. He's great. Um, I really wanted to call it Start Making Sense, but yeah. <laughs> But he's incredible in addition to being a big you know, proponent of urban design. Um, my research proposal, put that together, had a couple papers come out, but we did a lot of work. We got a lot done. We built a lot of community and got people to pay attention and welcome them into different ways of viewing the world and different experiences, which is a big deal. And I think that and also that experience setting up a big speaker series in the middle of the work week, back before we had remote everything. I think that that helped to set the stage for me to be able to lift up Max's work and bring attention to it within the bigger studio. Um, and he's been incredible. So Max, if you want to come join me up here, I can hand it over. But building community has been the biggest thing. Thank you for setting the stage and um, sharing how Olin Labs has given this platform for us to explore this research more, which I think is really um, crucial within the profession of landscape architecture. I also want to thank the Cultural Landscape Foundation and Lee for um, 
inviting us here. And I think this is the most number of times that the word queer has ever been uttered um, at a, a landscape architecture um, symposium or conference. So um, I'm really excited for that. So Pridescapes explores queer landscapes and seeks to clarify the importance of preserving queer spaces telling untold queer histories, and imagining new futures for historically and culturally significant queer landscapes. Visibility, research, and discussion of queer spaces and people within the field of landscape architecture has largely been missing from the pro profession's discourse. ASLA celebrated Pride Month for the first time in 2020. Identifying this gap within the field, one of the goals of Pridescapes is to tell the histories not being served by conventional landscape narratives. Sites invoke emotions, connections, stories of people, and what has happened in our past. In many cities, queer sites, queer stories, and queer memories have largely gone undocumented. To put this into perspective, the first successful nomination to the National Register of Historic Places for significance to queer history was in 1999. And in 2016, which was just six years ago, the first LGBTQ national monument was designated. As designers, we know that place and identity are so closely linked. Having physical echoes of queer identities in the landscape is incredibly important and can help queer and trans people connect with their own identity, reinforce a sense of belonging, and proudly acknowledge that queer and trans people have always existed in these spaces. As a community, the need for a preservation of our history in particular, the history of the spaces queer folks claimed, created, and helped to flourish is vital to educating younger generations on where we've been, what we've endured, and to help continue to foster queer joy. It helps us reaffirm the value of queer and trans people in public space. In recent years, there has been a push from professionals, academics, and activists to help tell these stories, underscore the value of preserving these sites, and to increase the overall visibility of these spaces across the US. I first want to take a step back and share where my inspiration for Pridescapes came from. This powerful scene from the television series Pose takes place in the early 1980s in the midst of the AIDS epidemic. The characters here discuss an island that now acts as a mass burial site. In disbelief of this landscape, I needed to know if it was real and how this landscape's history has been preserved and memorialized. Hart Island is an island off the shores of the Bronx in New York City and serves as the city's public burial ground. In 1985, 16 people who died, died of AIDS-related complications were buried quietly, alone, out of sight, and with deep stigma at the southern tip of the island. These would be the first of many. As such an important piece of the landscape and history of the AIDS epidemic, but largely hidden from the public, what does it mean to designate this as a significant queer space? As a queer person, what does this landscape mean to me? And as a society, what does this forgotten anonymous landscape tell us about our past and futures? Also, as a queer person within the field of landscape architecture, I have always wanted and needed more people like me to exist in the profession. As I launched Pridescapes, the search for other queer professionals and others doing this type of work began. I know there are so many of us in the profession, but as a whole, there's a lack of a larger network. There are also so many of us that came before that blazed a trail for us in the profession. It's my hope to honor those who couldn't be out in the workplace, those who weren't able to bring their whole selves to project designs, and those who lost their lives during the AIDS epidemic. Importantly, as a profession, um, as we're exploring Olmsted's legacy and landscapes, these two men come to mind, both critical to Central Park's redevelopment and both who died of AIDS-related complications. As we reflect back and continue to forge ahead, as queer designers, how are we going to sustain and maintain ourselves in the profession? How can we connect public spaces with visible queer and trans identities and stories? Public spaces have been an important place of mobilization, survival, and existence within the queer community, and a place where queer activism emerged. Early queer spaces were necessarily behind closed doors, where darkness and seclusion offered possibilities for remaking both the spaces between and the bodies themselves, like discos and clubs, bathhouses, and abandoned buildings. 
Activist movements, however, were the decisive breakout moments, the spilling out of queerness into public spaces. Through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, queer folks increasingly occupied and queered public spaces public and public imaginations, raising awareness and visibility through protests, gay pride parades, and demonstrations. Through these activist movements and the push to advance LGBTQ issues, iconic, historic US landscapes became the stage. Here we see Independence Mall, the Sheep Meadow in Central Park, and the National Mall in Washington, DC, all key platforms for the queer activist movement. Public spaces are also deeply tied to the queer community. Parks were places where queer individuals, particularly marginalized in individuals, would go to escape oppressive homes, find their community, cruise for love and belonging, and as we just talked about, mobilize to start the contemporary LGBTQ rights movement. The piers at the end of Christopher Street, um, which is the image on the left, memorialized in the documentary Paris is Burning, and the Belmont Rocks in Chicago featured on the right, um, were an epicenter of queer congregation. Public spaces that embraced queerness provided the opportunity to meet other members of the queer community, share the same space and stories, allowing many to experience queerness without shame or fear, often for the first time. We have landscape architects have also been involved in the breaking up and disappearance of queer spaces. In the early 1990s, planning was underway for the re rebuilding of the New York City waterfront, including the Christopher Street Pier for what would ultimately become Hudson River Park. The initial planning process did not address the presence and needs of the queer and trans communities, especially queer and trans black and Latinx youth. In Chicago, a US Army Corps of Engineers shoreline protection project removed the rocks that queer and trans people would gather at and thus their place of community. While these spaces are now redesigned with new amenities, biking and jogging paths, and ultimately new developments, they are no longer the same queer spaces they once were. Public space is also a place of violence, especially for the most vulnerable members of the queer and trans communities. Queer and trans people of color, particularly black and trans women, are some of the most vulnerable people in society because of the intersection of oppressions they face. In 2021, 50 trans people were killed, a record number. In 2019, two black trans women were killed here in Dallas. According to data from the FBI, 33% of anti-trans hate crimes occurred in public spaces. What is our role as queer designers, as designers as whole, to create safe, accessible places where people can be themselves without fear of violence? All of this said, queer public spaces are fundamental to mobilization, collective coming together, and visibility. The opportunity for the intermingling of different members of the queer community, the joyful atmosphere, and the normalization of sexuality and sexual freedom is incredibly important. As public spaces disappear, so do spaces of shared history, cultural memory, and places of possibility. Pridescapes aims to speak to the intricacies and complexities of queer existence in public space, but also how queer and trans people interact with landscape and architecture and how they imagine and reimagine their futures. We aim to create spaces within the profession for queer and trans landscape designers and architects to advocate, share work, and support one another. So how do we start to build community and exposure to queer spaces? Um, the first thing is that we did as part of Pridescapes was organize a three-part lecture series exploring three distinct aspects of how queerness is reflected in the built environment. The multidisciplinary panel brought together national experts within the fields of landscape architecture, including professionals from Mass and Design Workshop, and from the fields of planning, historic preservation, as well as um, local community activists and leaders. Within the firm, we've co-organized walking tours and sketch, sketch crawls in the neighborhood in Philadelphia and in West LA, where we learned and relearned the history of the space of those who dreamed about it and created it. We all end up in one way or another in queer space, and often we don't even know it. It's important to know the history of these places, how they have emerged and changed, and what role they now play in community mobilization and community building. And then finally, within the Philadelphia design community, we organized a happy hour where queer and trans landscape architects, planners, and architects came together to celebrate pride, form connections, and collectively dream about a queer and trans future in the field and beyond. Over 80 design professionals attended, again marking in the, the interest in queer design, 
designers, and queering the profession as a whole. Pridescapes hopes to continue these explorations and start reaching out at a national level. Um, speaking at this conference is one of the ways of raising awareness of queer design, and we hope to continue to spread this and to create a larger network of queer designers within the field of landscape architecture. Thank you. Thank you.